Welcome to the Shuv Show. Come and let us return to the Lord. Is studying scripture all Greek to you? Maybe it's because you're thinking like a Greek. Time to swap that linear mindset of check boxes and vanishing points and start understanding life like a biblical Hebrew. Concrete, physical action, and cyclical. What has been will be again. Time to walk as Yeshua walked, the Derech HaKodesh, the way of holiness. Time to shuv, to return to the Father's house and His ways. This is the Shuv Show. He shall come to us as the Welcome to the Shuv Show. I'm your host, Christine Jackman. I've now lived long enough to have some hindsight into recent history. Patterns stand out, good and bad. We've just passed the month of Elul, a time of deep introspection and repentance, and have now completed the fall high holy days of Yom Teruah, Yom Kippur, and Sukkot. Read Vayikra, or Leviticus 23, and all scriptures that deal with these three holy appointed times of our God. These are memorials and they are prophetic. Remember that a biblical mindset is Hebraic, meaning you think in terms of cycles. Things are cyclical. What has been will be again. Earthy, concrete. Answers are not a Greekish either-or situation, but rather can be yes and both. The biblical thought process understands that blood covenants are not broken by God. Covenants are to be taken very seriously, and our Creator is a faithful, covenant-keeping God. His covenants are forever because He lives forever. There are three fall feasts of the Lord, better rendered from the Hebrew, the three fall Moedim, or appointed times of the Lord. These are special appointments where He draws near, desiring that we are to meet with Him. The first of the fall Moedim is Yom Teruah. With its solar eclipse this year, the second this year falling on an appointed time of Adonai, the last being the spring on Nisan 1, or the Biblical New Year. Yom Teruah falls on Tishrei 1 on the Biblical calendar, the first day of the seventh month. Note, you can go to heapcal.com for the solar lunar Biblical calendar. The Gregorian date of the feast will change from year to year. Yom Teruah is called the Feast of Trumpets or Shofarot. Next up, Yom Kippur or Yom Kippurim, Day of Atonement, Day of Atonements, Solemn Soul Searching Prayer and Fasting, National Atonement. Lastly, Sukkot or Feast of Booths, Tabernacles. It's the time of our rejoicing, the happiest of the appointed times of Adonai, and forward looking to the kingdom where Messiah will rule and reign on earth and dwell in the midst of us. The last of the blood moons of this tetrad was on the first day of Sukkot year in 2015. It is said that a solar eclipse falling on the appointed times of Adonai means trouble for the Goyim or Gentile nations, and a blood moon falling on an appointed time of Adonai means trouble for Israel and those grafted in with her. Some rabbis say that a blood moon means trouble for Israel's enemies. Regardless, our Creator told us that one of the functions of the sun, moon, and stars was that he would use them as a sign or signals to us. Signal or sign in Hebrew is ot. So when we see signs falling on appointed times, that's the time for us to draw even closer to him and ask, What's up, Baba? But if you are clueless about these feasts of the Lord in Scripture, you will miss a signal. Ever stop and think about why Adonai chose Nisan 14 in the evening for Pesach, or Passover? Well, for one thing, it will always be a full moon. Same with Sukkot. The first day of Sukkot will always be a full moon. Well, the one thing about a full moon is you can't have a a lunar eclipse without a full moon. So blood moons only happen on a full moon. The people were supposed to be assembled on these days. A rest day, a Shabbat, no work. Look up and, oh, the moon is turning to blood. What's up, Abba? Only he knows what this given signal is to mean, and he wants us to draw near to him to get our marching orders. In 2014, there were blood moons on Passover and Sukkot, and Israel had war with Gaza. Now, it's 2015, with not only blood moons on Passover and Sukkot, but also two solar eclipses on Nisan 1, the biblical new year in the spring, and Tishrei 1, the Jewish civil new year in the fall. 
I would also like to point out that these two dates are also the two New Year's of the Babylonian calendar. Hmm. So, in light of our current troubled times, where up is down and down is up, good is called evil and evil good, seeking his face is even more imperative. Are we seeing signs of the approach of the Great Tribulation, the return of the Messiah? Or is it just another repeat of a pattern? Time will tell. Study the patterns in Scripture, namely Daniel, and the pattern of Antiochus Epiphanes, who was a type and shadow of the Anti-Messiah. Study the name meanings of the sons of Joktan. Ask the Lord for understanding. His love for us is very deep. And we are not children of darkness. We are children of the light. All in all, though, when we see signs happening on appointed times of the Lord, our Heavenly Father is saying, Heads up, come and seek me. Do not fear. Our God is immensely able to save. Look at the three in the fiery furnace of Nebuchadnezzar. Consider Daniel in the lion's den. Our God is mighty to save. Dare to be a Daniel in the Diaspora. Stand firm like Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, and only your bonds will fall off in the fire. Your clothes won't even smell like smoke. If we can get to the point where we say with Job, Though he slay me, yet I will trust in him. That's about right, isn't it? You find that in Job 13. We look beyond this life. We will rise again. Messiah, our firstfruits, showed the way with his resurrection. But certainly the very best place to be is bullseye center of his will. May we be bold enough to walk in his ways regardless of the potential costs, regardless of the mockery, regardless of rejection by others. We need to cling to him, and his arms are certainly strong enough to hold us. Nahon? I find comfort in this prophecy from Revelation 3. starting with verse 7. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, He who is holy, who is true, who has the key of David, who opens and no one will shut, who shuts and no one will open, says this, I know your deeds. Behold, I have put before you an open door which no one can shut, because you have little power and have kept my word and have not denied my name. Behold, I will cause those of the synagogue of Satan who say that they are Jews and are not, but lie. I will make them come and bow down at your feet and make them know that I have loved you. Because you have kept the word of my perseverance, I will also keep you from the hour of testing, that hour which is about to come upon the whole world, to test those who dwell on the earth. I am coming quickly. Hold fast to what you have so that no one will take your crown. He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he will not go out from it any more. And I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God, and my new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Wow. Seven little verses that speak volumes. I can't go into deep detail here, but here's a little summary of what I see. You can go dig deeper later. First of all, I see it's very Jewish in flavor. The titles Messiah gives himself in each of these letters to the Messianic assemblies are lamps that shed light on the rest of their particular message from him. To the Philadelphian church, he addresses them. His title is, He who is holy, who is true, who has the key of David, who opens and no one will shut, who shuts and no one opens. End quote. End quote. Okay, to unlock this phrase, you must search the Tanakh. Yeshua is referencing Isaiah 22, and Eliakim, son of Hilkiah. Eliakim, a Kohen, replaced Shebna as steward over the house, the temple, and was given the keys of David that opened and shut the doors, allowing access. Yeshua, who is now Kohen Gadol over the heavenly house, is telling this congregation, because they have Quote, kept my word and have not denied my name, end quote. He is keeping the door of access to the Father open for them, the word and the name, the Torah and Yeshua. Saved by grace through faith, walking the holy lifestyle of the redeemed community, that is, obeying the covenant terms, the mitzvot, the commandments, out of love and gratitude, enabled by the Ruach HaKodesh. Think of it. Messiah keeps the doors open for us. 
ever interceding for us, and he knows that we have little strength. It goes on to say, quote, Behold, I will cause those of the synagogue of Satan that say there are Jews and are not, but lie. I will make them come and bow down at your feet and let them know that I have loved you. End quote. Who is a true Jew? One who is circumcised in heart, obeys the mitzvot, the commandments of the covenant, through the power of the Ruach HaKodesh who writes them on the heart. One who has accepted the way of atonement through the free will offering of the suffering servant who provided salvation. Yeshua. He is our righteousness, Yeshua of Nazareth, Son of God, Son of David, the Lamb spoken of by Abraham that day on Mount Moriah with Yitzchak, Isaac. The suffering servant of Isaiah 53 is a yes and yes. Yes, it's talking about Israel, and yes, it's talking about Messiah, not an either or. The Philadelphian congregation keeps his word and has not denied his name, Yeshua and the Torah. Yeshua came in the authority of his Father and his word. Yeshua did not have a different message from what had already been revealed in the Tanakh, Genesis through Malachi. Those books are not the Old Testament, as Christianity has come to believe. God is unchanging. The rules of his house are good instructions, always have been, always will be. I keep the feast of the Lord and the Shabbat on the seventh day because that is the original word from the Father. Those and all the commandments found in the written Torah or the, quote, law of Moses, end quote, Yeshua kept and taught his Talmudim, his disciples, to keep, to guard and do them. What he had a problem with were the traditions of man that set aside the original word. It's not just certain teachings of certain sects of the Pharisees that set aside the Word of God, either. Stop and think. Where, after the first century, have we seen that pattern of setting aside the original commandment of God for the sake of traditions or the rulings of a council of men? Verse 10, quote, Because you have kept the word of my perseverance, I will also keep you from the hour of testing, that hour which is about to come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. That phrase, keep you from, that word from in Greek is ek or ex, can mean from, out, or through. So he will either keep you from the hour of testing, or keep you out of it, or keep you through it. Any way you look at it, he promises to be our guardian. Because this congregation keeps or guards the word of his perseverance to endure patiently, he promises to likewise guard them. The command here is to, quote, hold fast to what you have, end quote. Stand firm until the end. Eventually the earth is renovated and cleansed by fire, and then the new Jerusalem comes down out of heaven. And we're back to the garden pattern. The thing is, when times get bad, we need to hold fast to the truth found in the Word and cleave to Messiah Yeshua, who is mighty to save. We need to seek Him for guidance. But the question is, Let's be honest, how many times do you and I approach the Father, not really asking for direction, but that our will would be done? Let's look at an example from Scripture. Let's go back in time to the account recorded in Jeremiah 41. By this time Babylon had come and destroyed Jerusalem. The land of Judea lay in ruins. Nebuchadnezzar had placed Gedaliahu, or Ged Gedaliah, as governor of Judah, but Ishmael, son of Nathaniah, of the royal seat of David, rose up and killed Gedaliah. Yochanan, son of Kareach, eventually overcame this rebel, killing many of Ishmael's followers, though Ishmael himself escaped the Ammonites. We see that the people already had this thought in mind. Quote, Let's escape the wrath of Babylon by going to Mitzrayim, or Egypt. Then Yochanan came with the people of Judah to seek the word of Adonai on this matter from Jeremiah the prophet. Let's look at Jeremiah 42, 1 through 3. Quote, then all the captains of the forces, and Yochanan the son of Kareach, and Yizania the son of Hoshia, and all the people from the least even to the greatest, came near and said to Yirmiyahu, or Jeremiah the prophet, let, we pray you, our supplication be presented before you, and pray for us to the Lord your God, even for all this remnant, for we are left but a few of many, as your eyes do see us. 
that the Lord your God may show us the way in which we should walk and the thing that we should do. End quote. Sounds noble, huh? They appear to be asking for direction from the God of Israel. But when the answer came ten days later, God said through Jeremiah, this is found in Jeremiah 42, verses 10 through 12, God told Jeremiah to tell them, quote, If you will still abide in this land, then I will build you and not pull you down, and I will plant you and not pluck you up. For I repent me of the evil that I have done to you. Don't be afraid of the king of Babel, or Babylon, of whom you are afraid. Don't be afraid of him, says Adonai, for I am with you to save you and to deliver you from his hand. I will grant you mercy, that he may have mercy on you and cause you to return to your own land. End quote. Okay, that is the original word, the clear command of the God of Israel to his people. Can't say it any plainer than that. Don't go to Egypt. Stay here. He also goes on to issue a crystal clear warning if they disobeyed. Jeremiah 42, verses 13 through 18. But if you say, We will not dwell in this land, so that you don't obey the voice of the Lord your God, saying, No, but we will go into the land of Mitzrayim, Egypt, where we will see no war, nor hear the sound of the shofar, nor have hunger of bread, and there we will dwell. Now, therefore, hear you the word of the Lord, O remnant of Yehudah, Judah. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, If you indeed set your faces to enter into Mitzrayim, and go sojourn there, then it shall happen that the sword which you fear shall overtake you in the land of Mitzrayim, and the famine of which you are afraid shall follow hard after you there in Mitzrayim, and there you shall die. So shall it be with all men who set their faces to go into Mitzrayim, and to sojourn there. They shall die by the sword, by the famine, and by the pestilence, and none of them shall remain or escape from the evil that I will bring on them. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, As my anger and my wrath has been poured forth on the inhabitants of Jerusalem, Jerusalem, so shall my wrath be poured forth on you when you shall enter into Mitzrayim, and you shall be an object of horror, an astonishment, and a curse, and a reproach, and you will see this place no more. End quote. Wow. The warning is plain and understandable. If you go to Mitzrayim, Egypt, you will die. Jeremiah also warns them in verses 19 through 22. The Lord has spoken concerning you, remnant of Yehudah. Don't go to Mitzrayim. Know certainly that I have testified to you this day. For you have dealt deceitfully against your own souls. For you sent me to the Lord your God, saying, Pray for us to the Lord our God, and according to all that the Lord our God shall say, so declare to us, and we will do it. And I have this day declared it to you. But you have not obeyed the voice of the Lord your God in anything for which he has sent me to you. Now therefore know certainly that you will die by the sword, by the famine, by the pestilence in the place where you desire to go to sojourn there. Okay, watch. Immediately, Jeremiah is met with opposition in Jeremiah 43, verses 2 through 3. Then spoke Azariah the son of Hoshia, and Yochanan the son of Tareach, and all the proud men, saying to Yirmiyahu, Jeremiah, this is what they said to Jeremiah, You speak falsely. Adonai our God has not sent you to say, You shall not go into Mitzrayim to sojourn there. But Baruch, the son of Neriah, sets you on against us to deliver us into the hands of the Kazdim, that they may put us to death and carry us away captive to Babel, or Babylon. End quote. So the true heart of this remnant is revealed. The leaders and people who said they were seeking the Lord's instructions were not actually seeking the truth, but confirmation of what they had already clearly set their hearts on, and that is, to flee to Egypt. So Yochanan, the son of Kareach, rounded up the people and left and went to Egypt. Later, the word of God comes again to Jeremiah for the rebellious remnant now living in Egypt. A warning of the consequences for disobeying the instruction of God were soon at hand. Jeremiah 44, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, You have seen all the evil that I have brought on Yerushalayim and on all the cities of Yehudah. And behold, this day they are a desolation and no man dwells therein because of their wickedness, which they have committed to provoke me to anger 
in that they went to burn incense and to serve other gods that they didn't know, neither they nor you nor your fathers. However, I sent to you all my servants the prophets, rising up early and sending them, saying, Oh, don't do this abominable thing that I hate. But they didn't listen, nor incline their ear to turn from their wickedness, to burn no incense to other gods. Therefore my wrath and my anger was poured forth, and was kindled in the cities of Yehuda, and in the streets of Yerushalayim, and they are wasted and desolate as it is to this day. Therefore now says the Lord God, Zabaiot, the God of Israel, why commit this great evil against your own souls, to cut off from you man and woman, infant and suckling, out of the midst of Yehuda, to leave you none remaining, and that you provoke me to anger with the works of your hands, burning incense to other gods in the land of Mitzrayim, where you have gone to sojourn, that you may be cut off, and that you may be a curse and a reproach among the nations of the Eretz, the land. End quote. Wow, did you catch that? Not only did this remnant blatantly disobey the word of God through Jeremiah the prophet to not go to Mitzrayim, but now they're worshipping the gods of Egypt in Egypt. Burning incense, praying to false gods. Remember, God's judgment by the hand of the Babylonians fell because the house of Judah had broken the terms of the covenant with the God of Israel and refused to repent. The actions of the remnant that fled to Egypt revealed that most had refused to see that it was their own sinful practices that had destroyed the holy temple, their cities, and their people. They blamed Hashem and had now bl turned their backs on Him and were praying to foreign gods instead. Adonai says to them in verse 9, Have you forgotten the wickedness of your fathers and the wickedness of the kings of Yehuda, and the wickedness of their wives and your own wickedness? wickedness of your wives which they committed in the land of Yehuda and in the streets of Yerushalayim? They are not humble even to this day, neither have they feared, nor walked in my law, nor in my statutes that I have set before you and before your fathers. Therefore thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Behold, I will set my face against you for evil, even to cut off all Yehuda. I will take the remnant of Yehuda that have set their faces to go into the land of Mitzrayim to sojourn there, and they shall all be consumed. In the land of Mitzrayim they shall fall. They shall be consumed by the sword and by the famine. They will die, from the least even to the greatest, by the sword and by famine. And they shall be an object of horror, and an astonishment, a curse, and a reproach. For I will punish those who dwell in the land of Mitzrayim, as I have punished Jerusalem, by the sword, by the famine, and by the pestilence so that none of the remnant of Yehuda who have gone into the land of Mitzrayim to sojourn there shall escape or be left to return back into the land of Yehuda, to which they have a desire to return to dwell there. For none shall return, save such as shall escape." End quote. Pretty clear, huh? But what is their response? Even harder hearts. Look at verse 15 through 19. And all the men who knew their wives burned incense to other gods, and all the women who stood by a great assembly, even all the people who lived in the land of Mitzrayim, in Petros, answered Yemiahu, saying, As for the word that you have spoken to us in the name of the Lord, we will not listen to you. But we will certainly perform every word that has gone forth out of our mouth, to burn incense to the Queen of Heaven, and to pour out drink offerings to her, as we have done, we and our fathers, our kings and our princes, in the cities of Yehuda and in the streets of Yerushalayim. Get this. For then we had plenty of food, and were well, and saw no evil. But since we left off burning incense to the Queen of Heaven, and pouring out drink offerings to her, we have wanted all things, and have been consumed by the sword and by famine. When we burned incense to the Queen of Heaven, and poured out drink offerings to her, did we make her cakes to worship her, and pour out drink offerings to her without our husbands? Jeremiah responds, Hear the word of the Lord, all Yehuda who are in the land of Mitzrayim. Thus says the Lord of, of hosts, the God of Israel, saying, You and your wives have both spoken with your mouths, and with your hands have fulfilled it, saying, We will surely perform our vows that we have vowed to burn incense to the Queen of Heaven, and to pour out drink offerings to her. Establish then your vows, and perform your vows. Therefore hear the word of the Lord, all Yehuda who dwell in the land of Mitzrayim. 
Behold, I have sworn by my great name, says the Lord, that my name shall no more be named in the mouth of any man of Yehudah in the land of Mitzrayim, saying, As the Lord God lives, behold, I watch over them for evil and not for good. And all the men of Yehudah who are in the land of Mitzrayim shall be consumed by the sword and by famine until there be an end of them. Those who escape the sword shall return out of the land of Mitzrayim into the land of Yehudah few in number. And all the remnant of Yehudah who have gone into the land of Mitzrayim to sojourn there shall know whose word shall stand, mine or theirs. This shall be the sign to you, says the Lord that I will punish you in this place, that you may know that my words shall surely stand against you for evil. Thus says the Lord, Behold, I will give Paro Hophra, king of Mitzrayim, into the hand of his enemies, and into the hand of those who seek his life, as I gave Zidkiyahu, king of Yehuda, into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babel, who was his enemy and sought his life. End quote. Ooh, God means what he says. Let's look at the people's response to Jeremiah again in verse 16. Let's revisit it. As for the word which you have spoken to us in the name of the Lord, we will not listen to you. But we will certainly perform every word that's gone out of our mouth to burn incense to the Queen of Heaven and to pour out drink offerings to her as we have done. We and our fathers, our kings, princes, in the cities of Yehudah and in the streets of Yerushalayim. For then we had plenty of food and were well and saw no evil. But since we left off burning incense to the Queen of Heaven and pouring out drink offerings to her, we have wanted all things and have been consumed by sword and by the famine. End quote. They were under the mistaken notion that the so-called Queen of Heaven, a false goddess, was responsible for the blessings of food, prosperity, and safety that they had been experiencing in Judah in the times before the Babylonian invasion. They were pinning whether or not their behavior was acceptable on a sign and not truth. And that sign was blessing. They did not see that their blessing in reality came from the God of Israel and not a false goddess. From this account it's apparent that God will sometimes use blessing as a test to see what's really in the heart. Just because things are going good, it's no guarantee that your actions are pleasing to Him. He's already revealed how He wants to be worshipped and how we are to live our lives. These truths are discovered foundationally in Bereshit through Devarim, Genesis through Deuteronomy. House of Judah had the Torah, the clear instructions from the God of Israel on what to do and what not to do. These were the terms of the covenant with him, and his instructions were, and are, doable. Moses told us that. Yochanan also bears witness to that truth. His commands are not heavy or burdensome. Yeshua said his yoke was light. Do we follow sign or circumstance or truth? If that sign or circumstance is based on God's original word, then heed it. If not, run fast. Truth is based on the written word of Adonai. Circumstances do not change truth. Current culture does not supersede or alter truth. When a people turn their backs on his holy commands, and they don't get struck immediately with lightning, does not mean that God is condoning their actions. It might be hundreds of years later before retribution comes. His silence demonstrates the fact that he is long-suffering, wanting to give people time to repent and come back to his ways. So prosperity, or the lack of judgment immediately falling, is not a good gauge of a lifestyle that's acceptable to Adonai, and neither is poverty a sure sign of a circumcised heart? Only truth can stand as judge regarding our actions. The original word given to us by Adonai is a thing we are to obey, in good times and bad. Torah is the straight stick by which we eyeball whether a thing is acceptable in his eyes or not. If your idea stick looks a bit bent compared to Torah, toss it out. Lean on the word. His ways will always be best. And remember, he is the lamb, but he's also the lion. He is tender and fearsome, judge and savior, worthy of our awe, respect, and love. Let's examine our lifestyle. Does it match up with the original word given by the Father and upheld by his son, Messiah Yeshua? Do we live our lives like Yeshua did? May we, with the help of the Ruach HaKodesh, the spirit of holiness, have our minds renewed, 
our hearts circumcised, and put on fine linen, which are the righteous acts of the Kedoshim, the Holy Ones. Revelation 9, 8, and 14. It was given to her that she would array herself in bright, pure, fine linen, for fine linen is the righteous acts of the Kedoshim, the Holy Ones. The armies which are in heaven followed him on white horses clothed in white, pure, fine linen. Ecclesiastes 12, 13 through 14. This is the end of the matter. All has been heard. Fear Elohim and keep his mitzvot, for this is the whole duty of man. For Elohim will bring every work into judgment with every hidden thing, whether it is good or whether it is evil. End quote. Torah, not just a history lesson. It's the lifestyle of the redeemed community of the Messiah. Fine linen is like this, saved by grace through the blood of Messiah who paid the price of our sin debt. Now our lifestyle is by Torah, out of love, gratitude, and duty. This is the original word, the clear instructions of our God. Let us not be a rebellious remnant, but a contrite one and a faithful one. Let us not base our lifestyle on anything, no sign, no wonder, no circumstance, but the pure truth, the scriptures. Go back in the Bible and search, asking, now what was the original word of God in this matter? When you find it, then do it. This has been the Shuv Show. Lila Tov, good night. That wraps it up for this edition of the Shuv Show. Don't forget to visit shuvshow.com, S-H-U-V is in virtue, shuvshow.com for archive shows, details on my music, and the Shuv Store. Thank you for listening to the Shuv Show. I'm Christine Jackman, and we'll drosh again. Till then, Shalom Aleichem.